Hi, I'm standing here in front of the Lee Kintner House in Galveston, Texas. It's a fabulous old Victorian mansion designed by noted architect Nicholas Clayton. And we are a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to saving and restoring this house and opening it to the public. Until we get to the point where it's safe for you to come personally, I want to take you on a tour inside and show you just how grand this house was at one time some of the condition issues it has today, and our plans for restoring it to its original grandeur. I wanted to show you the front of the house before we go in. Look at the grand scale that this thing is. I mean, it's huge. And not only is the house huge, but it is on a gargantuan lot. It's a half a city block. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. I wanted you to see and get a sense of just how big and impressive this house is. It's got this wonderful porch that wraps around to the side and this great porticoche on the end. Underneath me, flanked by these wonderful columns, is this beautiful set of solid slate steps. These are just gorgeous. So come on in and let's take a little bit closer look at the porch. So here we are on the porch. You can see it goes from one end of the house to the other. It's got these incredible 15, 16 foot ceilings. It's very breezy and nice up here. And right center coming up from the steps is this incredible entryway. It's boarded up right now because we've had some vandalism. And I've just left that there from when I bought the house until we're ready to open. But look at the work and the plaster around the door and the arch. This is going to be a really grand entryway when this is redone. Moving down the porch, it goes all the way to the other end, but then it wraps around. So we've got this great little round area. I can imagine a little table sitting out here and it turns and opens towards these windows. They're boarded up also, but these are full height windows that can be opened up and you can walk through as if they were doors into the house. And this would have been awesome because back when this house was built cars and carriages would come through the porticoche to let guests off they'd come up the second set of slight steps enter onto the side and be able to walk directly into the house so this was a fabulous house for entertaining and i think that's what the first floor was built for so let's go on inside and take a look and show you what that looks like as you step through the exterior doors, you'll enter the small foyer or vestibule with this beautiful faux mosaic tile in traditional Victorian colors. Going through the second set of doors, you step into the house proper into what the plans call a reception hall. Let's take a quick minute to get oriented. Standing at the front door, looking to the back of the house, on the right is the sitting room or library. And to the left is a large parlor. Moving towards the back, there's the dining room to the right, and to the left is the sunroom added in the 1920s because goodness knows this house wasn't big enough. And this little hall takes you back to the kitchen and servants area. Let's jump back up to the front and take a more detailed look at each of these rooms. The library is in really good shape. The wallpaper is a reproduction of a 1920s style pattern, and I'm in love with these bookcases with the leaded glass. This amazing plaster fireplace is the first of six you'll see, and fun fact, all the fireplaces were designed for gas logs and are mostly decorative. Even the massive chimneys on top of the roof don't have a lot of purpose. The windows are boarded up to keep vandals out, but you can imagine how beautiful this room will be when they're open onto that curved porch in the front and these amazing 30 light beveled glass upper windows that are completely intact have sun coming through. The windows are commonly called walkthrough windows because when they're raised all the way you can walk through like a door. Opposite is the parlor. It's so large but it's hard to really get scale in this video and unfortunately all the windows are also blocked with plywood, so there's not a lot of light. But you can see the subtle grandeur of this room. It has an elegant marble fireplace and these wonderful column details. 
and I can't wait to get these beautiful cornices down to look at them up close. This room is not in good shape and I'll dive into that in a later video. Stepping back into the receiving room as we move towards the back of the house, you see we go from this one story height into this grand staircase area that goes up the full height of the building. Other than the grand scale of this house, the most outstanding feature is this magnificent set of stained glass windows. They're not showing as beautifully as they could because they're also covered with plywood for protection. There's another video coming where the windows are being removed for safekeeping and at the end as they're being taken away, the sun comes shining through and they just took my breath away. To the right of this open staircase is the dining room, which connects to a butler's pantry, which in turn connects to the kitchen. You can also access the butler's pantry in the kitchen through the servants' hall, which is where all the work in this house was done. There are stairs leading down to the basement, a nook for the refrigerator, and this wonderful staircase that goes up to the third floor, unlike the grand staircase that only goes to the second floor. The second door is an elevator, and then there's a door to the outside and to the right, the butler's pantry in the kitchen. The kitchen is just amazing to me. The Victorians would only have had a sink, a stove, a work table, and perhaps a freestanding cabinet. You can see this kitchen has never been remodeled, so everything is just the way it was when the house was built almost 130 years ago. It was designed with a ventilation system to take hot air out of the kitchen, in addition to the chimney where the cook stove would have vented. The walls are white tile, typical of the Victorian era, and everything looks pristine, but looks can be deceiving. In a later video, I'll explain why, out of all the major problems encountered in this house, the kitchen is the thing that breaks my heart and makes me want to cry. At the rear of the kitchen is a small pantry. It was probably used for food storage, since all the dishes would have been stored in the butler's pantry. Behind this is another room that opens to the exterior, where they could store additional items. Let's jump back to the butler's pantry. It's hard to film in here, but it's actually a generous sized room with large cabinets for storage. Connecting the kitchen to the dining room, it would have been here to serve guests and I imagine many grand dinners for the Galveston elite back in the day. Now we've passed from the butler's pantry into the dining room. Like all the other main living spaces, the dining room had its own fireplace. This one is pink marble with a beveled mirror that's just beautiful. The dining room also has walkthrough windows that go to the outside veranda. I can't wait to see this house with all the plywood down. This room will be flooded with light and it's going to be gorgeous. The rich paneling and coffered ceilings are super fancy. At first glance, things look good in the dining room other than my sad light fixture that someone tried to steal. The dining room also has this built-in buffet for display and also for the practical purposes of serving food. Stepping out into the dining room and back into the staircase hall, we move into the addition that was added in 1920. You can see here I've drawn the red rectangle on these plans where this room was added onto on the northwest side of the house. The house was remodeled by Eliza Kempner, the second owner of the house, and it's just wonderful. You can see the 20s influence in the Spanish Revival style of the arch windows, but sadly they covered over one of the stained glass windows when the room was added. This is the same wall where I have the video of that one finger demolition, a bad harbinger of things to come. You can see we've completed the demolition and exposed the stained glass so we can assess damage and do repairs. As we make our way up to the second floor, you'll notice that all of the bedrooms open into this large landing area. The bedrooms also open to each other. This was done to allow for air circulation. Galveston is hot and humid. Since hot air rises, all the hot air would flow through the house, through these open doors, and rise up through these little squares, which are actually open vents exhausting air through the cupola on top of the roof. We'll start our tour on the second floor in the original part of the house. When built, there were three family bedrooms. This is the smallest. This is the third fireplace directly above the dining room fireplace. It's very simple. These two doors would have originally opened to an open air porch on the front. 
That porch has since been closed in. Part of it is now a small bath. You can tell right away this is a 1950s or 1960s edition, which was further borne out by a newspaper I found in the wall during demolition. Stepping through the bathroom, we're now on what would have been the open porch on the front. Closed in during the 1920s remodel, again you see another one of those doors that would have led from the primary bedroom out to the porch with the same 30 light beveled glass detail above that we saw in the library in the dining room downstairs. The master bedroom is expansive. I can't think of a better word. It has a very large walk-in closet and its own fireplace. You can see the connection to the first bedroom we previously walked through and also the connecting door to the bedroom to the west. Again, all of this is for airflow. I'm really excited about this room because it has an original light fixture and something I think is really cool, the original sink. When this house was designed, each bedroom had a sink and there was only one bathroom for the entire family. Everyone would get ready in the morning or get ready for bed in their own room. I dive deeper into Victorian hygiene habits later in the family bathroom video. Here you see that generous walk-in closet. Heading back to the stair landing, we go next to the west bedroom. It has a small rounded porch on the side that was originally open, but again closed in in the 1920 remodel. This is the sixth and final fireplace, and this room also has a generous closet. I think part of the need to remodel this house came from the desire for more bathrooms. This bedroom connects to the new addition through this wonderful 1920s bathroom. I've never seen anything quite like this for tile. It has the original tub and rain shower head and shower curtain rod. The original vanity has been removed and the toilet replaced, but those are easy fixes. I couldn't believe my luck when I was researching 1920s bathrooms and found this artist rendition of a bathroom from the period. It has the exact same tile on the walls and that's the same tub. It gives me a great idea of what kind of sink I need to look for. The bathroom connects to the bedroom that was added. You see a repeat of that style from the sunroom downstairs in the curvature of the doors and the other detailing. When a portion of the stair landing was carved out to create a separate entrance to this bedroom, this dressing area was created. I'm back on the stair landing of the second floor, heading to the rear of the house. Look at this wonderful fretwork, different in style than the fretwork over the stained glass windows. There's a large cedar closet for additional storage and next, the original family bathroom. This bathroom had its tub removed, but it still has this gorgeous original sink and what I think is an amazing faucet. It even has the original plumbing under the sink. There's lots more about this bath in the family bathroom video. As we exit the bathroom, we now go into that servant stair area. On the first floor below us would be the butler's pantry. And to help orient you, here's the elevator that was at the back of that servant's hall. There's a very generous servant's bedroom, but notice there's no ornate plaster work. We've moved from the fancy painted wood and wainscoting to a very simply stained beadboard. Although this room is plain, it's still a nice sized bright room. At the very rear of the house is the servant's closet. The tub probably came from the family bathroom when the shower was added. Originally, this closet had a sink in the corner that they called a slop hopper, which is where bedpans were emptied. This tub can go back to its original location in the family bathroom. The servant stair led up to the third floor. Mostly unfinished attic when the house was built, there's still some interesting features up there. The first is this old Otis elevator. Tucked in the corner of the back attic space is a four foot wide by four foot tall by 10 foot long copper tub where water was pumped from the cistern in the basement to the attic so that it could be gravity fed through these pipes to the bathrooms and kitchen below. There are several videos about the basement and the collection of water for household use. Moving to the front of the house, we pass this cute little nook and then come to a full bathroom. 
I think this bathroom was added in 1920, and it appears they took one of the original sinks out of their bedroom and brought it up here to repurpose it. It's identical to the one in the family bathroom, dating from 1893. From the bathroom, you can access the laylight area and the cupola. This is where all that hot air can escape, creating air movement through the house in the summer. There are all kinds of little nooks and crannies of attic space tucked away around the house, and it's been quite fun exploring and understanding exactly how this house was built. Moving to the front of the house, the attic was closed in to create two bedrooms. There are great views from this third floor. As you exit back into the hall, perhaps my second favorite feature of the house is this attic space that you enter through a screen door. It's largely unfinished, but you can see the shape of the cone roof on the front porch, and it's got these wonderful windows with an amazing view of the magnificent Bishop's Palace, which is another Nicholas Clayton design. Tucked away in the far corner is the sink, which the servants would have used. This hand pump drew water from the copper basin in the attic next door. If you've made it this far, you're a true old house enthusiast and may have some questions about who built this house. Let me start with a little bit of Galveston history. Galveston was one of the biggest and most important cities in Texas. The port was booming with cotton trade and great wealth was made by the men who came here to seek their fortunes. The wealthiest of those like to show that wealth by building these large, flashy homes up and down Broadway Street, the main entrance to the city. Galveston has hundreds of other fine homes, but these were the showiest of all, and they were meant to display wealth. Unfortunately, many of the homes up and down Broadway have been demolished over time. Victorian homes fell out of favor, and the Galveston economy never fully recovered after the 1900 hurricane, and many of these homes were unsellable. There just was no market. They also suffered from hurricane damage. Increased tourism on the island and the advent of the automobile meant that their lots were valuable for gas stations, convenience stores, and fast food restaurants. So through time, most have been demolished and only a handful remain. One example of this is the Lasker home, which used to sit right next door to the League House just to the west. The Lasker mansion was demolished in 1967 and apartments were built in its place. These apartments can still be seen today. The Leak House fortunately was not threatened by development because of deed restrictions placed on the property by the Kempner family when it was sold in 1972. But it's at serious risk of falling down due to neglect and decay. So much so that in 2021, it was placed on the Galveston Historical Foundation's list of at-risk properties. The League House is also important because it was the last residential commission taken by prominent Galveston architect Nicholas Clayton, who designed the well-known Bishop's Palace. League also chose to conspicuously display his wealth by building his home on over half of a city block of land. That completes our tour. I hope you enjoyed walking through this incredible house with me. Be sure to subscribe and turn on your notifications because it's going to be an uphill battle to restore this house and I hope you take the journey with us. By watching these videos, you can have a part in saving this house. See you next time here at the Lee Kempner House in Galveston, Texas. questions.